Good morning. Abby, Glenn, Ian, this uh, topic of this verse, this section of scripture should sound at least partially familiar from what we talked about this morning. <laughs> Hopefully you remember what we talked about this morning. <laughs> Second Peter 3, 8 through 13. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all, these, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Take just a second to say thank you again for prayers on behalf of Elisa and her travels and for her family, especially continued for her brother Jerry. Uh, difficult time, obviously, he's having a hard time with it, as to be expected. Um, and mourning goes on for a long time, probably the rest of your life. So we appreciate the prayers, especially Lisa's traveled back and forth so much and traveled from, she's been in Texas and Louisiana, that's bad enough, isn't it? Watching my Texans out there. <laughs> Don't think we have any Cajuns. <laughs> I was close, but not quite. <laughs> Curtis is back. Good to see Betty. <laughs> I just had to say that. <laughs> Miss Betty, sure did. <laughs> All right, today I want to look at something that's really a pretty popular thing today, right? Climate change. I'm not going to quote any 17 year old Swedish girls. I'm not going to quote any other children that think they know what's going on, or even the pundits. I'd rather look and see what God says about climate change, and I'm not talking about raising, rising sea levels, temperature swings of half a degree centigrade over 100 years, or any of that sort of thing. I want to look at what real climate change is like, what it really means. If you're like me, I've heard for years, we, it used to be global warming. That wasn't all-encompassing enough. When I was a kid, the whole world was freezing. Now we're burning up. Now we're just changing. Now ecosystems are dying. Now all these things are going on. Species, old species are being wiped out. But you know what? When God says when this world is over, everything is going to be wiped out. It's no longer going to be here like a lot of the folks like to say today and tell us about. So I wanted to turn this on, first of all, since it works now, I think it does. And look at some scriptures this morning and understand what real climate change is. When I look at it, and you may have seen, you ever seen these guys, maybe not dressed quite as snazzy as this guy, but the guys with the billboards and the posters that stand out, the end is nigh. I used to see them, they had the one that wore like they're advertising for the sandwich shop. They kind of slid over them, had a board in the front and a board in the back. I used to see things like that or other scriptures or things they'd have on there. But when you look at what the Bible says, and think about that passage Derek just read for us a moment ago, and you look at the, have the understanding there of it, and he deals with an idea of time, but really what he's dealing with is eternity. For one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years are as a day. And a lot of people miss two little words there that are called similes in the English language, as. <laughs> he doesn't say one day is, one day as. And the idea is, it doesn't matter with God, God's timetable is God's timetable. He's going to take this world into account one day, and one day his long-suffering, according to verse 9, is going to end. And have you ever heard the prognosticators figure that out? I have read of a number of dates, even in my lifetime. The, the most recent I remember was 2011. That fellow in California had it all figured out. Spoiler alert, he missed it. The world didn't end in 2011. 
But when you start reading newspapers, start reading other things, and then you go to the Bible and try to figure it all out, that's what you get. Uh, William Miller did it back in the 1840s. Other folks have done it over the years. But the Bible says when God's timetable is there, that's when He will, according to verse 10 through verse 13, we just had read for us, destroy the world. And please notice He says with a fervent heat. Heard an old time preacher one time say, fervent. I guess that's a little hotter than fervent. I don't know. A fervent heat, he said. A fervent heat. But the idea is burned up and destroyed. I make emphasis there because I've heard people over the years, and I guess they still say it, say, no, no, that's not what that means. It's going to be burned off and start over all anew. Let me tell you something, folks. When I read my Bible, one thing that, I, that, points, that sticks out to me more than anything else is that I'm going to heaven, not going to stay here. Why do you want to stay on the earth when we've got heaven waiting for us? Did not Jesus say, I go away to prepare a place for you? If he was going to be here, why would he go away? Why didn't he just prepare it while he was here? Where are our mansions or abiding places? Why aren't they here? Folks, look, the Bible is as clear as it has ever been. This world, the universe, the planets, everything in this world, the physical world will be gone. Now, there is climate change. This world is going to be burned up with a fervent heat. And we look at what the Bible says there and elsewhere, we understand that the saved are going to be saved and go on and spend through judgment day and spend eternity in heaven, and the lost will be lost and spend eternity in a devil's hell. And that is it. And people say, oh, that's not sensational enough. What do you want? The entire universe dissolved in a... Uh, P, or excuse me, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, in a moment in a twinkling of an eye, faster you can blink your eye, it's all gone. And that's not sensational enough? My, my. We have become accustomed to really sensationalized advertisements and movies and everything else that no longer that the blinking of an eye, the world and universe as we know it is gone, people are in heaven and hell for eternity is no longer good enough. But that's simply the way it's going to be. Uh, we have seen folks, I read commentaries on this passage over the years just to see what other people like to say about it. And it's interesting. I've seen people say, no, that's not, doesn't mean burned up or dissolved. It literally means the word, they said the Greek word means, that's how you, you get a little suspicious when they say, well, the Greek word actually means. And then they say, well, it means like you burn off a field to start over. Have you ever seen anybody do that? Burn off cornfields and stuff. It's good for the ground, soil, what have you. Burn off a field and you start over, and we're going to start over here in this utopian society on this, work, on this earth. Now, folks, you've got to do a lot of writing in the margin in 2 Peter chapter 3 to get that in there. It's gone. And by the way, the Greek word doesn't mean that at all. They say that like nobody has access to be able to read what a word actually means. Like we're going to stand back and say, oh, so-and-so said it, and that's it. Folks, I tell you all the time, don't trust me. Don't take my word. Read your Bible, please. Let's see what the Bible has to say about it. But it says it's gone. Climate change is coming. And we can't get rid of fossil fuels to change it. We can't protest to change it. We can't have new laws on the books of man to change it. It's going to be here because the God of the universe who created fossil fuels, by the way, who created the world, who created legislation, who created everything, says it is over when he says it's over. In Revelation 22, though, I want to make mention of that just for a moment of the purity. John sees there after the persecutions of the church, after all the things, after the beast and the false prophet thrown in the lake of fire and brimstone, which burns forever and ever in the end of chapter 20, after all the evils and all the things are behind, he pictures a utopia, folks. But it's not about here. Because he sees that river, that pure river of water of life. But please notice where he says it's coming from, the throne of God and Jesus. That's not down here. But he sees that pure water of life coming out. 
he sees that water coming flow. The idea of pure water of life has always been in the Bible the idea of spiritual purity. But it's coming out from between the throne of God and Jesus. That's where it's coming from, from heaven itself. He sees those things coming out, and there's never going to be any more need for thirst, hunger, or anything else, because even in this place we have the tree of life, and it's interesting. When you read Revelation, it doesn't make sense as far as a common sense reading of something. But that tree of life, one tree is on both sides of the road. It must have a tunnel in it, maybe, right? The picture is it's everywhere. Those leaves are broadening out there. All those things are pictured. And we have paradise restored, quite literally. We've got the river of water of life. We've got the tree of life. And we have the Son of God and God Almighty forever and ever and ever. And let me end it the way he does. Amen. Folks, there's our climate change. We've gone from a complete obliteration of the entirety of creation, which is everything that ever is, all material things came from God, to a complete spiritual re, uh, reawakening, looking at eternity, where things no longer bother us. So yeah, there's going to be a physical climate change. Sure is. But, folks, don't get all up in arms about stuff that doesn't really matter anyway. So what if the world as we know it ends in 10 years? What does that mean? And really, that's a legitimate question. <laughs> if you listen, I read a lot of that stuff. I shouldn't, I guess. But the point is, what we need to read is what God says. Yes, there's going to be a change. Yes, things are going to happen. And the end may be nigh. Compared on God, but what do we read in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8? One day is a thousand years, and, one, and a thousand years are as one day. Anything in God's mind is nigh. A million years from now could be nigh, right? When compared to eternity. But there's a spiritual aspect of this, folks. We don't need to forget, looking what we just did on the physical side of it, but a spiritual side of looking at climate change. And there, will be a spirit, there should be a spiritual climate change. If you go back to Revelation for just a moment in chapter 21, beginning of chapter 22 just a moment ago and here one of the also in chapter 7 and verse 16 and 17 similar passage that God says through Jesus and through John that God shall wipe away every tear from their eye there's no longer going to be thirst or crying or hunger or any of those things needed uh, I've always loved the song no tears in heaven haven't you Love to hear no, no tears in heaven, uh, but only after God wipes them away. Did you notice that? It's not like we get there without them. I think we're going to get there with them, spiritually speaking. But God reaches out with his hand and wipes them away. God's going to wipe those tears away. You know why those folks were crying? I dare you to read the 20 chapters preceding this one. And you'll see why they were crying. Look at the way God illustrates and talks about all of the horrific things that were happening to Christian people. And he uses far out apocalyptic language to make it the point abundantly clear. They weren't real stingers on horses. There weren't those things there. But the pain they were feeling was real, physical and spiritual. And they were seeing all those things. There's a reason when they get to heaven, they're crying. I go back to chapter 6, understand something about why they were crying too. They could cry out among the altar, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you not avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? What's going to happen? But they're given white robes. You see a lot of robes in Revelation, don't you? White robes. And I love, I love the other way it's illustrated. White robes that were white, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Sounds oxymoronic in our, in our life, right? But it's not. The picture is they were clean. They were spiritually pure in that new world, understanding those things that they see before them. And Thessalonians there, again, the Thessalonians were like the Corinthians and like many others and like people today about questioning about our resurrection. Questioning about, in this instance, the resurrec resurrection of the good. The resurrection of the just, if you will. They were wondering about if they were going to miss, if they were going to stay asleep, as the Bible calls in the New Testament, death only to Christians. And what's going to take place? But here's the picture that Paul lays out for these folks, and it still lays out just as much for us today, of understanding something about that resurrection 
And keep in mind, in context here, talking about the good, the just, the saved, their resurrection. When the day of the Lord, when that day of the Lord appears, when that climate change really comes around, folks, you're going to hear Jesus from shout from heaven with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. Now listen to what he says, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. They've got an advantage on us. You know, we talk about folks that die in the Lord and how blessed they are, and they are, by the way. I'll prove it to you another time if you don't believe me. But they are blessed. But folks, look, they beat us to Jesus. They're raised first. Then those of us who are alive and which remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and, and remain with them forever. Now, folks, that's what God teaches. Now, there is a climate change that's going on that's nothing like anybody in this world can ever imagine. Pollution doesn't begin to touch what's going to happen here. Radiation doesn't begin to touch. Do you remember the hairspray scare? Y'all remember that? It's going to destroy the ozone layer. Worried me to death. <laughs> On two counts. <laughs> yeah, hairspray is going to... And don't use an aerosol can. Use a pump spray bottle. Remember those things got dead years ago? Yeah. Those doctrines change all the time, folks. But God's doesn't. Live the way you should. Paul says... I'll have it up here in... 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We end first, uh, chapter 4 there, wherefore comfort one another with these words, and we still do. We talked about the day of the Lord, and so don't let that Lord take you as a thief in the night. Don't be unprepared. People panic about things, right? About not being prepared for this, about not being prepared for something else. But the question that's always asked in the New Testament is, are we prepared for spiritually is our soul prepared for that you don't let a thief come in you're ready for the, if you know a thief's coming you're ready for the thief right you don't let a thief come and steal things take things away from you but be prepared for those things that are going to happen don't let our, those things take away from us and remember folks about, about that excuse me that spiritual uh, awakening is going to happen that should be verse 24 of 1 Corinthians 15 Back to that great resurrection chapter. Back looking at the things that, that Paul is dealing with there in Corinth and their confusion or their ignorance or whatever it may be about the resurrection, about their climate change, if you will. Looking at those things that are going on, Paul makes it abundantly clear when he goes through the things that are happening. He says, and then comes the end. There have been, you talk about sensationalism. The end of the world has been sensationalized for literally millennia. Uh, the stuff we've seen the last probably 25 or 30 years pretty heavy uh, about the end of time and the books and the movies and all these things that are coming out, uh, they have built on teachings that go back to probably about the second century. Uh, and sure, by the end of the first millennium after Jesus, there was a panic then. It was 1-2-K. They were scared to death about the end of that millennium because they, they said that's it it's all coming to a close and people did all kinds of things like they've done the last 20 years here they've had uh, sales they've had all the things that go on but folks when I understand something about what Paul said here then comes the end when Jesus is gonna he's gonna give back to God the kingdom that's us that's those of us living here, Christian people, give it back to God, and the end is no longer nigh, but it is there. And there's no time at the end of the world, no time when that true climate change comes about, to say, whoa, 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 time out. Now I want to repent. Now I want to make things right. And believe it or not, there are people that teach that. Need I remind us yet again? In a moment, in the blinking of an eye, you better be real fast if you're going to repent in that time frame. God says the time is now. God says the time is now to get things ready because the climate change is coming. When Jesus said in John chapter 5, he's been dealing with Jews, with Pharisees, with Sadducees, with all the other E's around there, and he's talking to them about things, and this very subject comes up about his power of resurrection, about his power to do those things. 
And that's why it says, do not marvel at this. He says, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves, now please stop just a moment, all that are in the graves, that's all the dead, that's the resurrection, and that is all, and that is both the good and the bad. Well, how do you know that? Well, because I've read the rest of it. All that in the grave shall hear his voice and come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of righteousness, justification, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of condemnation or damnation. Now, folks, that is it. I have listened to preachers in the past some years ago. They said, no, that's not it. There's going to be two resurrections, one for good and one for bad, years and years and years apart. Folks, let me tell you. When we read the Bible, you know what we get a better picture of? Everything. <laughs> Not just this, but everything. And we look at that climate change and look at the way the world is going to change and look at the way, hopefully, our world is going to change. We're not going to live in that, that world that, that says that, that's concerned about every little plastic bottle and every little thing over here, but in the world that's concerned about souls in a world that's concerned about the real climate change that's coming. And we understand about what God is going to do. That he has, listen to it again back in 2 Peter chapter 3, he has promised. Remember, the Lord is not slack concerning the promise as some people count that slackness. Now, he's not really going to do that. People really say that. And Peter foretold it 2,000 years before anybody else did. People are going to say, ah, that, that's not. God is. He's not going to destroy this creation. He's put too much work into it. People say that too. He's not going to destroy human beings. He can't do that. That's not God's way. I'm sorry, but God has told us His way. But look at the time He gives us from this very moment to all the moments we had before and however moments we have left in this life. Look at what He's given us. Talk about climate change. What about personal change? To change ourselves. If we're outside of Jesus Christ, He gives us time and time and time and time to make sure we do. He has given us ample opportunity, ample uh, uh, convenience to be able to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, to live that life, to know what we should do that is right and wrong, and to live our life solely and wholly for Jesus Christ and God Almighty. And folks, let me tell you something. You've heard some of these prognosticators, and they go on and on and on, and we used to call them doomsday preachers. If I'm a child of God, bring it on. Bring on the end of the world. Last time I read my New Testament, we're not supposed to cling to this world as if that's all there is. The last time we've read our New Testaments, we're not supposed to be so enamored with this world that we can no longer think about the next world. And good riddance to this one. It's temporary. It's here for a specific purpose to breed souls to spend eternity with God. I must conclude where I started. I don't want to live here forever. I want to live in heaven forever. This place holds nothing for me. should hold nothing for any Christian but rather to look forward to that time. If it's a Y2K, if it's a 1-2-K or a 3-K, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. It shouldn't matter to any of us. Let's go to heaven, folks. What do you say? All right, I thought that might get an amen. I've been kind of quiet this morning. Ray came back and got us all messed up. But we understand that very promise, folks. And let's go to heaven. If you're here, you're not a child of God, hey, don't stay in that pew today. But why don't you give your heart to God? Become a child of God. If you have and you've fallen, folks, if you have help, if you need help, if you're struggling, if whatever else it is, don't do it alone. We've got folks all around you right now and God in heaven to save us, to protect us, and to teach us. Let's take advantage of that while time is here. If you have a need, why don't you come while we stand and sing?